tells me too late. <laughs> Okay. 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 So we will start then. So we now have two wonderful keynotes in the this afternoon session. We will have uh, Reiner Gother and Josep Pintuarte. They are both live stream from the U.S. Unfortunately, not here with us uh, in Lisbon. So as we were talking, maybe. In the a, in a, in a, in a future moment, we can have you again here in Lisbon. Um, we will start with Rainer Gother. So I'm just going to do a, a brief introduction. Everyone knows you, but nevertheless, I'm going to, to present uh, a little bit. Um, so your career is very close related to physical planning and our, uh, an upgrading of low income settlements in physical design and in participatory techniques in urban development. Uh, Rainer is a principal research associate in the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT in the US. Uh, and he teaches courses on urbanization, design, and housing in developing countries. Renner Gother is also the director of uh, SIGUS, Special Interest Group in Urban Settlements. So this is a topic of research uh, that, as everyone knows, is being engaged uh, for long years. Uh, also, as a sole designer uh, or in partnership, Gother has designed sites and services, housing developments in several places in Central and South America, uh, Africa, and, and, and Asia. And he has also been serving as a consultant to numerous international development agencies and to housing um, ministries. So, just this was just a brief introduction. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be. Uh, we hope to be in Lisbon, not in Lisbon, uh, but with, with all of us uh, very eager to know uh, what you bring today, because also what you bring today is very much updated to the moment that we are. So we are very interested in knowing your approach uh, on the current uh, moment. Thank you. You have, you have the word right now, please. Okay. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much for those comments. Uh, my time's up, right? Yes. <laughs> no, um, I would have liked to have been in Lisbon. I was looking forward to seeing it. The, the advertising, the weather, the people, it's supposed to be fantastic. We made it to Spain last year and we said, well, we'll go to Lisbon next year. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be a while, I think, to be. <laughs> But anyhow, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to developing some sort of a link um, and working together on the project. Uh, we'll see how it goes. I've never been in Portugal. Uh, I've never been in Lisbon, obviously, um, but uh, I would like to go. Um, just as an introduction, it's, um, I hope things move. <laughs> Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about um, the, the whole notion of uh, compact cities and uh, to see the effect of that on the, with the virus right now. It's, it's actually what we're doing. We have a project going. We have it's a work in progress where we're investigating what we can do in this context for housing. And so we're, we're not finished with it, we're halfway through, but uh, basically I'll give you some of the thoughts that we're thinking of, some of the things that we're doing. Um, it's uh, essentially we're looking at housing um, and we're looking at the, uh, the virus. Uh, if I change the title, I know you asked me about the title and I said, gee, I'm gonna change the title, <laughs> but it's all the same. It essentially is looking at the third world as a housing of that. And uh, we're looking at the impact and if we can do anything, okay? And essentially we're still, we don't have answers yet. It's a work in progress. And I look forward to your comments in this group. Um, just as introduction, um, I'm talking essentially for us, we're spatial designers. We're, we're the people who are responsible for the physical environment. It's, uh, we're not sociologists, we're not doctors, we're not so on. And I wanna, what I wanna focus on is essentially the low-income majority, housing in the third world, 
And I really worry about what we can do in this context, particularly in the traditional kind of housing that we do, mainly the site and service projects, okay? Uh, the way we're going at it, we're looking at it in three different ways. We're collecting information. Uh, basically, it's a form of crowdsourcing except using news. You know, the information that we get is new. Um, it's uh, unclear. Much information is unknown. What you do, you read about, we don't know this, we don't know that, we don't know that, but we think. Uh, so uh, what we're doing, we're looking at that and, and seeing if we can make some sense out of that. It's a form of crowdsourcing, you could say. The thing that we're doing also, um, we're looking at the the housing uh, called encampments in the United States, which actually mimic, uh, I like to think they mimic site and service projects, not quite the same, but they mimic that. And we want to see what people do when they house people here. How do they reconfigure the layouts? How do they reconfigure the housing? And so we did a quick survey of the kind of encampments that you find here. And lastly, we compared this practice together with uh, the site and service projects, the bread and butter projects of the third world, particularly of the development community. And just again, I apologize if a little bit uh, choppy, we're uh, putting together this work in more detail and more in depth and trying to fill in the holes. But I think you'll get some idea of what we're thinking about. Uh, the, the information essentially is, lots of information. Um, uh, we, we, we try to see if we can find some commonalities. When we look at the encampments, we're surprised that there's all sorts of different forms that you can see, all sorts of units, all sorts of housing from very small projects to even uh, projects using cars, for example, park your car in a parking lot and this becomes your house and your shelter. So we're looking at those and to see, well, do they park them differently now? What do they do differently? Is it just the same as the house? There's a question, obviously. Is there really anything we can learn from this? You know, these are essentially considered to be temporary and the context is somewhat different. However, as you know, uh, temporary and housing essentially becomes permanent very often. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised in another five years or so that some of these encampments will become permanent. And then it'll be interesting to go back and see what happened. If you compare it to in the third world, the site and service projects, we have all these different options that we use. Essentially we build core housing and then people come and they um, add to it. If you look at the States, uh, here's what they, here's what we see here. They have shacks, they live on sidewalks, tents, cars, trailers, hotels, they go up in the scale of things. So they mimic, in a sense, the, the core house options that you can find. Again, it's not quite the same, but the variety for all sorts of different purposes exists. Um, you know, just as a quick review, you know, to, to get some information of it. Um, the thing that I found interesting, it's, uh, it can only exist three hours in the air. Okay, so you're safe. If you see somebody, uh, stay away for three hours, and then you'll be okay. Um, so you could, you could hold your breath for three hours if you're lucky. Okay. The other thing that we found, there's lots of studies done into it. You know, what's... Uh, you know, how do they come to grips with it? Because the information is so tenuous, uh, they experiment with many things. There's one where they did elaborate formula. I can see, you can see that it's very detailed. And they look at the different situations with well, sidewalks, coughs, talking, distance, ventilation, and they group it according to how many people, you know, the density of people, and they, they group it according to how long you know, you're, you're exposed to that. And then they mark, then they estimate, okay, which is safe. Uh, the green that you can see in the graphics is the safe areas. The red is unsafe. So 
They're very detailed. You can see all sorts of these things. Okay. What it comes down to really from the studies and many studies, the masks always come out well. And they, they even say, if you don't have a blast, don't come within six feet. Okay, it's a, so six feet is not super much, but apparently that seems to be the rule of thumb. And they calculate this in various different ways and come up with it. So what are ways that you can protect ourselves? And what people say is that obviously you minimize crowds, you discourage proximity, obvious. Um, you improve the ventilation, you contain it, you don't let it, uh, you don't infect people, you stop the transmission and they, you, you see a lot of this and they have different metrics where they try to find some number that one can use. Now, to this is in, in uh, this has been sloganized for many ways in something called three C's and like the closed, crowded, and close contact. It's uh, just another way of saying, you know, ventilation, stay away from crowds, stay away from, uh, stay six feet away, don't go to closed rooms. And so, so the three C's become sort of a shorthand way of, you know, of understanding the problems that you're faced with. Now, if we look at housing, in the third world, you have the informal housing, which is, uh, they actually outbuild everybody. There seems to be no disagreement about that. Um, you have the development community that builds houses. Uh, this is the, the World Bank, USAID, ODA, GTSET, and most of the governments. Um, and then you have the private developer. That's what we do. We're architects, planners, and we do this. Uh, each of them have different goals. The informal, they're very interested in space. They, their prime goal is to maximize the use of space. The development community, their goal is affordability. You have to reach low income, you have to make it affordable. And then the private developer, his goal is profit. Each of these, uh, these different perspectives, they end up putting pressure on the, on the space. They tend to uh, overload space. They tend to increase the density and we could argue this is not good. Typical housing you see in informal squatters uh, in the development community, it's site and services and upgrading projects. That's what they do. Um, in the private developer houses, high rises, essentially sprawl for houses is very common. Okay, and the worries for all of these is that you know, each one of these, they worry the three C's become very important. If we look at the informal squatters, um, they're everywhere. These are just some examples and they, some cities, 80% of that new housing is squatters. It's, uh, it, you've always heard about this um, you know, the question of what defines the city? Is it the downtown or is it the squatters? Okay, if you look at the squatter layouts in this example, uh, for the three C's, it's a very positive, good spacing, um, lots of open areas, good ventilation. You would say, hmm, what's the problem? <clears throat> in the development community, the formal, the main thrust of the formal site and service projects, they, these are essentially, they mimic squatters, but they formalize it. They provide the support which is missing. This is the standard widespread proactive policies that you see. This is that where we get involved with. They one day we design these for them. You know, this is a bread and butter projects of the World Bank. Uh, there's a recent, there's always a movement to eliminate site and services, and try something else, but they always come back to it. Uh, and site and services becomes the state of the art. And the question remains, in, in the context of the virus, is this still something that we can continue to do? And if not, uh, what's the alternative? The slogans of Science and Services from day one, you get pounded this in the school when you read this, it's affordability, cost recovery, replicability, and subsidiarity. The, 
affordability is the main thing. You have to minimize the project in order to make it affordable to as many people as possible. Essentially, you're competing with the squatters. Okay, and so an affordability means you make it small as possible, increase the density, get more people in there, spread the costs. Uh, you group services, you provide communal water points and so on, and you shoot for a maximum density. Okay, and then uh, the, the uh, community participation uh, keeps getting bigger and bigger as very important for these projects. They rely on the community to help decide what to do, to help design, and for sure to build the houses and expand the houses. By providing just a core house, a minimum core house, as inexpensive as possible, they can reach more people that way. And so for the task is then, okay, then how do people build these houses? Um, you, it, the experience shows that many times they rely upon relatives, neighbors, friends, and they group together and they build these houses. Ideal for spreading the virus. It really, if you look at the three C's, all of these goals are challenged. Um, the, the close contact by, by maximizing the density, they make a very tight, small communities. Um, by grouping services, it forces people to get together. Um, and so all the things that they end up doing uh, essentially challenge the wisdom of the three C's and what you, or the basic things that you need to do. You've seen uh, many projects uh, use clustered layouts and uh, the reason for that is that, uh, you know, clustered layouts, essentially you group about uh, 10, 20 people around a open area. It's great, it's a good place to meet. Uh, the community can strengthen each other. Uh, this, And uh, so it becomes a very important social mechanism. It becomes a very useful function for the community is that they can help each other, inform each other and guide each other in the development of their place. It's very uh, economical for the city to group things in clusters. You can look at it in terms of these clusters become one unit and in effect become uh, the entity that you plan with. It makes for lower circulation costs, lower spread. And it's found that uh, these clusters actually support the cultural factors. If you look around the ones we've seen, most of the cultures have cluster groupings. They call them different ways. In Sri Lanka, I remember they, um, the, gum, the gum goda became the term that they used for essentially a clustered layout. This was the traditional way of building. Okay, and uh, then in a legal sense, it becomes ideal for condominium, for cooperative. And so clusters became a very important mechanism in Latin America and parts of Central America, uh, clusters became more or less an adopted policy, particularly by the World Bank, and said, this is the way that you need to build projects. However, again, if you take the C3s, the crowded, the close contact, and you say, this is uh, not good. All these people group on these clusters. They have to go through the one entrance. Uh, it becomes a high risk area, but the open area does provide ventilation. You could argue that's not bad. The other thing that um, we can think about, you know, this the land development patterns that we design and that happens and everything ends up being a square grid. Uh, the, uh, and, but if you think about it, if you want to group things, if you say you want to keep the distance uh, of six feet, the importance of the six feet distance, and really you're thinking of a hexagonal type of a layout. These are the obvious, the honeybee layout. In the drawings, you can see what this, uh, this very graphic way of what this would look like. And, you know, some people actually try it. I mean, uh, this is just a fantasy example where the whole world is, is uh, distance, if you like, six feet and more. 
Okay, this is the ideal spacing, if you like, but in physical planning, it causes immense pop, uh, complications. Uh, the irregular space of the lots, the corners, uh, becomes very difficult. In practice, you see these things happen, though. If you look at the, the uh, Previ competition in Lima, where they invited all the top architects of the world to design housing, the community and housing, uh, several adopted the hexagonal scheme. And it became, in practice, it became awkward on how you actually build with it. But in terms of distancing, it's ideal, it's safer. But this is a hexagonal world. Now, in, in terms of the, the spread and transition, uh, the informal, the tends to be low income, you squatters, site and services, upgrading projects, the risk zones are in the community where they do, where they have communal facilities, they work communally and so on. The other risk factor is to have, they tend to have connections back in the rural villages. Um, and the house obviously becomes very small and very mean. Everything is used. Uh, there's no open space, no ventilation. The formal higher income tends to be different. They go to the city centers, they go to the world tourism, um, and in their high rises, they share spaces. And so we could make an argument that the transmission is, 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 <laughs> has become serious from lower income because of the constant traveling to the rest of the country. They don't keep it in the areas, but travel to the rural areas, infect villages, infect throughout the countries. You, you see that happening now. If you look at the news, uh, the rural areas are now surging with infections. And on the other hand, the, the, the higher income, uh, they be the tourists of the world, they spread around the world. So in other words, uh, the, if you're higher income, you travel a lot, you're actually spreading the virus everywhere. This is your contribution. Uh, you probably read that in um, in Europe, it came from the ski areas in Austria and Switzerland and so on. The young people went skiing, they come back and infect Europe. So you have two different forms of transmission. The, the uh, low income, the rural, they, with their contacts in the rural world, they spread the world throughout a country in the rural areas. The higher income, they have a different spread. It goes around the world and they can't stop it. So if you increase the safe distance to six feet, you double the distance from three to three feet, for example, uh, you increase four times the area for the lot. You get four times bigger. Okay, that means uh, lots are four times less, the density decreases, uh, the circulation area ratio is less. In other words, that's good. So if the lots are less, the density decreases, the cost goes up. And this is very safe, it's much safer than it was before. But the basic notion of affordability becomes compromised. And so the mantra of all the site and service projects, affordability above all, becomes compromised. Less houses, higher costs, more sprawl. And then the question is, okay, can we still support doing site and service projects? Can we still keep getting smaller and smaller, smaller lots, smaller houses, and so on? Increase the density, uh, inc decrease the density. Okay. So it's safer, but more expensive, and fewer people can take advantage. So if you look at um, the informal sector when we design it, you you have to look at them and they're incremental. Uh, they start small and they get, they densify. So the key to these developing site and service projects and any informal project is that they densify. Uh, the housing itself is, when you look around, it's, uh, you look at it and you say, at, in the early days, you would say, it's impossible. How did they do this? Uh, 
we tracked some of them once in Peru, we tracked them in Central America, in Colombia and Egypt, and it becomes very surprising. Uh, when we first started to work in Egypt, for example, in the 70s, uh, people would look at the houses and they say, it's impossible for them to have done that. They must have cheated. How can you cheat? Anyhow, these are some real examples. Uh, in the bottom is the one in Lima, the famous invasion of squatters. And if you go there now, you see houses more like you see on the right, the purple houses. It keeps going. The same pattern is done with sight and spirits. The difference is it's uncontrolled. And who does this? The growth, this is the examples in Egypt, for example. Uh, the growth goes for three levels. Um, yeah, let me go back. It starts out um, very simple. Um, they spread throughout the whole rural areas and then it infills and then they go up because they need space. Egypt is unique is that it's driven by investment from the Middle East. The labor pool of Egypt goes to the Middle East and is building the Middle East, come back with lots of uh, fund, disposable funds, and they invest it in housing. Okay, and they end up doing these very dense uh, areas. Okay, they saturate the lot, and as they have more money, they go up. Um, streets are a minimum, there's no benefit for them. Uh, no leftover space, no open space. Uh, it becomes a very dense situation. And then the question is, if you want to do something in terms of the virus, if you want to worry about distancing, worry about uh, open spaces, ventilation and so on, uh, circulation spaces, where do you intervene? Uh, one would, one argument is, is that when they fill in when they infill the development, that's the time to do something, to attempt to do something. It's very difficult once they go up, uh, once they build vertical, then they have, um, um, they have the usual problems that you have in vertical houses. It's there, it's physically there. You can't change it very differently. Just an example. Uh, you have the informal incremental. This is in Egypt. This is right now in Egypt. There's no control of what happens, and the government is actively trying to destroy them for various reasons. Families make these decisions. They have this immense amount of money that they continue to build, uh, bring from the Middle East, the remittances. Uh, the rooms are very small, minimum shared spaces. The government doesn't like it because they... Uh, are covering the area around Cairo. The fringe developments are getting bigger. So they've tried many things. The government, meanwhile, has tried formal versions of that. They build high rises, more or less, small rooms, and the, uh, the, with minimal input of the people that come. And then with the, the government high rises, the they make the halls obviously wider, more ventilation, better entry, bigger rooms, but the cost is higher. And so the difference at the end between these two is that they're both high rise apartments. Uh, the, the rooms are relatively small. The hallways are relatively minimum. Uh, they have shared spaces, the entryways, and these are all areas where it becomes difficult to control. Um, again, you can look at the different kinds. The, this is another example. If you look at the, in one, you have the vertical formal, you build up, and you have distancing issues. You have elevators, stairways, units bigger, less people, uh, nuclear families. The informal tends to be horizontal. The streets, parks are all minimum. Units are much smaller. Extended family even makes the density much higher. Okay, so these become very risky areas. The three C's are violated right and left. It's very difficult. Some argue that the gross population density could be the same. One is horizontal and one is vertical. 
that's questionable, but in some cases that's true. So basically, these are the two kind of worlds that you see. Um, both worlds suffer from the controlling the virus from different aspects. Um, if you look at the, the distancing uh, more in detail, on the right you have the uh, squatters, uh, the usual problems, very narrow streets, very high density, every piece of land is used, no open space, no ventilation. And on the left you have this, the sprawl, the normal uh, middle income, higher income areas very generous, lots of open space and so on. So it's it's not unexpected that the infection rate is much higher in the low income areas. It, it's built in. You have the cultural patterns also that make it difficult, that add to the problems. Uh, they have traditional clusters in traditional societies, um, very close living together. Um, again, these again, they violate the basic distancing, ventilation, density criteria, the minimum kind of things that you have to do. To remedy that is very difficult. Uh, on the left, again, you see the difference, uh, the different culture, a different situation. They do not promote the traditional cultures at all. Everyone else. So there's a cultural aspect that you have to worry about. <clears throat> And really what it comes down to is income, the whole notion of poverty. Uh, if you have the money, you can pay for the distancing. If you don't have the money, you make do, you maximize what you have. You use every amount of space that you have, which again, challenges, compromises the notion of how you combat infections. So basically it comes down to the fact it's income. Uh, tongue in cheek, if you look at the squatters in Lima, they don't have roofs. Great for ventilation. Um, great for open space. They put a perimeter wall as the first thing they do, and this automatically distances them from the neighbors. To some degree, it's not perfect, but they they're very conscious of that. Um, as uh, we can say that they're not conscious of infection, but they're conscious of distancing from the neighbors. Um, the streets are relatively wide. Again, uh, great ventilation, good mobility. Uh, seems like this fits with the, all the criteria that you worry about when you design these. Perhaps an ideal. The ideal really, if you look at extreme cases, have you ever seen people living on the side of mountains? Um, they have a, uh, some people go to extremes, obviously, to maintain the distance. Okay. So the, the thing about Lima that this is um, on the coast, it tends not to rain. So roof speed are not necessary. And this is um, a positive thing for uh, controlling transmission. So uh, what can we do? Well, we, well, we, what we're doing now, we're looking at, we're trying to map the actions and the impact level, the different kinds of actions that one can take. And we've decided we've grouped them into three different families of things. It's the notion of personal responsibility. You know, um, how do you get people to be responsible? Keep the distance, for example. This personal responsibility is very tricky. Masks are very common. Distance is the other aspect. The, the, the other aspect that we see is are the cultural aspects. You know, you have festivals, you go to the Mardi Gras. How can you not have people to, uh, grouping together? Crowds um, going out and being a communal society. They say as a Mediterranean society where it's very communal, uh, you have to get to, these are very strong uh, forces which bring people together, which makes it difficult to control the transmission of the viruses. And then you have where we come in, the physical modifications, make bigger houses, make bigger hallways, 
make higher ceilings to let more air go through, do single loaded corridors, um, and so on. These are physical modifications. And then we then we looked at we're grouping them, looking at the three different scales of things. We're looking at for the house scale, the lot scale, the lot scale particularly. In a suburb, for example, you have big lots, lots of open area, lots of ventilation. The community scale, community neighborhood scale, and then the city scale. We're developing a matrix and evaluating the actions at these different levels. For example, uh, we want to see uh, if we look at the cost aspects, how would they figure here? Uh, for Clearly, the, the cost is the highest for the physical modifications. And for, um, for new construction, it's very expensive. Upgrading is almost is super expensive. Uh, the cheapest that you find, the lowest, is a personal involvement. Keeping the distance is essentially, to a large degree, costless. It costs the, it costs the the community, the neighbors, nothing, a little. So um, we looked at uh, what's the easiest way to, to use these, to incorporate these different parameters. Uh, and we looked at how, how widespread, you know, for example, uh, the widespreadness of uh, people getting involved in changing, say, high rises, making halls more, making halls more, increasing the ventilation and so on is uh, takes money it takes effort it's not not that widespread and so there's others we're trying we're working on developing matrix for each of uh, uh, metrics for each of these attributes and to specify exactly okay what criteria what's critical and what's not So it comes down to, if you look at it in a very gross way, that the best choice is really is um, the personal responsibility, okay? And what that comes down to is mass and distancing. I'm sure you've seen that a hundred times and the people are, you see it everywhere, in fact. And if you look at the ease of implementation, it's very simple to do. Wear a mask, stay away. It's easily, the distribution is easy. You can even make it yourself. The potential that everybody can do it. There's no income stratification. It's not like a sprawl and high density squatter. Uh, this is uh, the personal responsibility. It can be by all income groups. High income can wear masks, low income can wear masks, middle income, everyone. Children, adults, teenagers all wear masks. So it has the potential to reach the whole population. The cost is very low. In fact, it's extremely low. You can even do it yourself. And uh, it's important that people can understand the benefit. You know, if you wear the mask, you don't spread the disease, your grandfather won't get sick. And these things are very important. So what we're finding or what we're becoming clear, and it seems like the world is becoming clear on that also, is that the personal responsibility becomes the key. It's not what we design, it's not uh, improving the, the layouts, it's just the personal responsibility will do it. It was found that, um, I did include the graph, that if you wear masks, uh, even for a little while, the transmission drops 40%. And it's, so the payback is very, very high for very little. The problem with all of this, the personal responsibility is that the compliance is very difficult. The thing that is astonishing always, why don't people do this? Uh, you see <laughs> at the universities here, as they're slowly opening up, you see, uh, large parties, get together parties, no masks, groups, big crowds of people. And then a week later, you say infection rate goes up, school closes, not uncommon. 
You see this all over the world. Uh, it's uh, for some reason it's not taking. And so th the problem really is, um, you know, how do you get people to comply? How do you get people to wear masks? Uh, we, we looked at this probably four groups of of uh, ways to approach it. Um, and then we're looking at to see which is the most effective. And then, for example, we said we as architects, planners, engineers, how can we help this process? The four levels are very clear. The incentives, how do you, uh, we'll give you something if you wear a mask, we'll give you a free hamburger or something. Information, very important. You have to get information out to people. The social media has become a, a big thing, posters. Um, way back, what we did, we used to put out information on milk cartons or flour bags, sugar bags, uh, the milk carton says, or cereal boxes. You eat your cereal in the morning. Need and widespread. Um, what happens if people can't read? So you have to be inventive about that. Oops. The other thing is that um, the leadership, I think, is probably the most important. If the leadership doesn't make a state, doesn't show that this is serious and everyone needs to participate, it's very difficult for everyone else. Uh, it's uh, you, you see this leadership, this failure of leadership everywhere. Uh, this thing is always, uh, I hate to say it in Brazil, there's no, he says this doesn't, <laughs> well, you know Brazil, I don't even belittle this, or, the, or Trump, he says this is not for real. And a lot of people follow this leadership, unfortunately. So leadership is very, very important. Leadership, not just by the leaders, but also on the social media, the newscast people, uh, the programs that you see, no masks. Uh, the last thing that you see is the enforcement, the threats. Uh, what you see now in New York, uh, they're discussing if you, and in some other countries, if you don't wear a mask and keep your distance, we will find you. This is probably pretty serious and it's probably not possible to enforce, but threats is always a, a way to do it. And what you see in the information, you see things like to children's books has come out uh, and to get children aware of this or uh, in the enforcement threats, uh, you have all sorts of things. You have the military called out and so on. And then you see the cartoons, the daily cartoons. Um, again, these are all ways to grab people's attention and for them to reflect and to think about it and say, let's do something about this. So really, in my opinion, compliance is probably the most serious problem. It's clear, I'm sure you've seen a hundred times over, the importance of masks. There's no, seem to be less discussion about that. There's the influences of, uh, there's probably three areas of influences that uh, help compliance, there's social cultural factors. Uh, for example, a big influencer here in the States, they, you have football games, you have baseball games, and you have the audience is empty. And I'm sure that's the world around. You have an empty stadium and they do the sports. That's uh, pretty impressive. You say, whoa, why are they doing that? Okay, the built environment, okay, is, is uh, probably not that effective, but uh, that's very useful. And the systems that you develop that encourage distancing or uh, mitigate distancing. So at the end, where does this leave us? Some open questions. So what do we do now? We can say, some people say, well, it's going to go away. Uh, we can use herd immunity. Uh, vaccines will be here. So we just have to wait. Uh, learn what we see now and just wait. 
it's unlikely this is going to happen. Then you start seeing pushback and saying, it's not going to be that easy. Vaccines, maybe a year, two years. Herd immunity, forget it. It doesn't work. It's immoral. How can you infect people? Uh, you shouldn't do that. There's a big debate with the uh, the World Health Organization on when this came up and, this, and CDC about let's deliberately impose, get people sick. That's not going to work. Vaccines, as you know, is a big problem. Um, it may come here by the fall. In the States, what do they say? 40% of the people refuse to take it. They don't trust it. Um, you have to ask yourself, are you going to take it when the vaccine comes out? If you ask myself, I'm not going to take it. I'm going to wait a long time to see what happens. I don't trust it. But anyhow, it, uh, eventually, I suppose they will have vaccines and they will work. Uh, the thing about MIT, they do all these tests here. When we get tested for MIT, they have these quick instant tests, which the laboratories do, but this is not still not widespread. So the, the be patient, relax, do nothing is probably not a very good movement. So in other words, we a lot of architects that I know, a lot of offices closed, work is probably stopped. Uh, relaxing is not going to do it. So really, there seems to be four issues that would be worthwhile to think about. Um, the site and service approaches that the development community pushes to combat the squatters is probably going to needs to change. Community participation, which is the answer to the world is uh, uh, it's going to be it's very difficult in the um, in the world of the virus and we can argue that masks and distancing is the best immediate and long-term strategy in other words it's not just for now but for the long term and this all leads to the complex city ideals becomes compromised and sprawl is welcome So, in the site and services, no more projects, is that the answer? Upgrading increases, squatting increases. How can the development community shift to non-project support and still make housing? Participation, uh, are there other ways to get community to participate? Do it with virtually if you want. Uh, are mask and, and distancing really the best way to do it? I, I would argue they're simple and expensive. You can do it today, do it tomorrow. New construction, existing construction, you're independent of the physical situation. Compr the compact city, the high density, efficient, concentrated development, and the health concerns override these things probably. And so the question is, uh, which one would you push? What would you suggest? What we're thinking now is to think about the rating system uh, for the physical planning uh, to, to aid the uh, policymakers and designers. And when you look at a project, to what physical changes could you recommend? Uh, or do you need to really push the individual responsibility more? And how would you do this? Uh, you need to figure out the criteria. How would you, how would you rate a, phys a, a layout? Uh, you obviously you make a typology of the cities, look at the different types and try to develop a base to develop a, we can call it a risk index. Uh, again, we're thinking about the metrics involved in that. Maybe something like this. These are two neighborhoods of different, uh, of low income areas, middle income areas in, in Latin America. Maybe something like this. You give points for things. Um, if it's a very wide street, good ventilation, give it three points. If it's a very narrow cul-de-sac, little narrow thing, little narrow walkway, requires uh, proximity becomes very difficult. It concentrates people, subtract points, and then add them up. This is a, this could be one way to think about it. So. I think it's worthwhile to experiment. Whatever the future really 
no matter what happens, I think you should be masks. Uh, it's uh, for you, yourself and for others, you need to mask yourself. That's really what I think is going to happen. I am. I think Sarah has got the right idea. We should all give her a point. She gets a three C <laughs> for doing it. Great, thank you. Okay, I, I will take the mask out just because yeah, it's easier to read the lips if without the mask. So it's a problem already. The mask is a problem. You yeah, have to get, you have true. to use Vaseline that's on the lips. <laughs> that, that, that's true. Thank you very much, Reiner, for your um, for your talk. Very interesting. Um, we 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 decided that it would be more rich to do a discussion after the two uh, presentations. So I will all the questions of everyone here in the, in the room and also uh, online, and I will give the room to to Jeff White. I'm going also to do a brief presentation. Of course, again, everyone uh, knows Jed Bart, but I'm just going to, to do a little introduction. So uh, Jed Bart has a long career on technology-oriented architecture research uh, and uniting academic research and industry, as well as fostering multinational partnerships. He's now the, the Stuckman Chair in Design Innovation and Director of Stuckman Center for Design Computing in Penn State. And he has been working in the US uh, for several years. A problem for Portugal, but okay. Uh, first by obtaining his PhD in MIT, and then also as a postdoc, and now uh, with his chair in design innovation. But nevertheless, we, we got him for several years also. I'm, I'm one of the happy persons that did PhD with that part. So, and we have lots of um, ramifications of, of, uh, of the research here in Portugal. Uh, where we created several orient, uh, technology-oriented architecture degrees, as well as established facilities in, in Portuguese universities uh, for research. So thank you very much also for accepting our invitation. You know very well Portugal, so for you it's not such a pity, but of course we would like to have you here. Please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> Hello, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, quite well. Okay, very good. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to be making this presentation here today. Also because Reiner presented before me and I have to say that Reiner was probably the first uh, professor at MIT that I met. So thanks to him, um, I think I was accepted to MIT to do the master's and then the PhD. So Reiner, thank you very much uh, for all you, that you have taught me over um, the years. So you are for me a, a reference in many ways. Uh, not uh, least, uh, you know, a humanitarian reference for all the work and concern that you put uh, in, in people and in the communities. So um, my presentation today ends up with the question, the ethics of all work, um, but uh, that's not the topic of the presentation. That's what I would like, you know, the discussion to uh, address. What I'm going to present today uh, is the work that we have been doing uh, for um, on 3D printing. Uh, initially for Mars, but the end goal is actually to use a technology to make affordable housing on Earth. And that's what I will try um, to explain. Uh, let me see if I can. Okay. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I uh, am the director of the Stuckman Center for um, Design Computing. And the center has its missions and goals, you know, to support the integration of digital technologies in design and construction. But I should say that the focus is not on technology, but on strategically using technology to address contemporary societal issues. And we align our mission with the United Nations 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which you can see here at the bottom of the slide. We don't address all of them, but as much as we can, and it's a reference for the kind of work that we do. This is a, a, a graph that Reiner showed many years ago at the conference uh, in, in Rio. I think it was the United Nations Forum uh, in Rio many years ago, uh, which I attended with him. Um, and I was very impressed by this graph and by you know, the observation made after the graph says, you know, considering the growth of the human population, we will need to build over the next uh, 20 years 
as many houses we have built in the past 2000. So in 20 years, do as much as we did in 2000 years. So uh, what is the solution? So there's a, gr a, a growth of population, particularly a growth of population in, in cities. And there are different approaches um, to the problem or different uh, consequences of the problem. So what you see in this slide is a series of uh, different cases. So you have the, uh, you know, the concept of informal settlements, which are unplanned, they're very customized, but they also you know, lack infrastructure and there is, uh, they are a little bit chaotic. On the other hand, is what we could call the formal approach to the problem, you know, usually led by governments. And they also have very pro many problems. They, they are planned, but uh, they are very uh, uniform, orderly. Uh, they do have infrastructure, but they don't have you know, much public spaces, which are relegated to a second, secondary um, aspect. And what we would like to do is to find ways to design new uh, settlements with the qualities that we value in historical settlements. So there's, these are all images from Brazil. So it's a favela in Sao Paulo. It's a development uh, you know, near Rio and it's a historical uh, city, uh, you know, the city of Ouro Preto in Minas Gerais. Uh, and what we like to do is to find a way to plan new settlements with the qualities of these historical settlements that grew incrementally over time. So according to the United Nations, uh, by the year 2025, you know, about 900 million people will live in informal settlements. Uh, and you know, uh, now and it will double by 2025. So this is you know, a huge uh, problem. And it's something that we cannot forget and should you know, be at the core of our work as architects and urban planners. Um, so what happens with these settlements, you know, they, have, they do have some qualities and uh, what I see, I see them not as a problem, but as a solution with problems. So it's a different, uh, you know, take uh, on the issue. So not a problem, but a solution with problems. So they are sustainable, otherwise they would not exist. Uh, in Rio, they are centrally located, so people don't have to do uh, big uh, commutes. Uh, they are complex, you know, visually stimulating, spatially rich, and they are very colorful and also affordable. On the other hand, they have no infrastructure, no green spaces, they have a huge ecological impact and they have no public spaces either. So um, the idea and the solution that I'm proposing, at least as one uh, aspect of the solution is the fact that digital technology can provide the means for the, uh, developing and applying a new uh, design methods that will enable us to develop and, and build um, you know, informal um, or formal affordable uh, settlements. So I've been running for the past five years what uh, we call the World Studio. So the World Studio is, you know, is a, a design architectural and urban planning design studio where we take students to different parts of the globe uh, to study informal settlements, uh, local informal settlements, trying uh, to learn from them, extract rules that we can you know, uh, reuse uh, transform and reuse in the design of new settlements. So we basically what we want to do is to learn from the process and find a way to hack the process to generate settlements that have the qualities that they have, but not the flaws. So in a nutshell, that's what we're trying to do. So part of the solution. So I like to use this slide. So I've been using this slide for many years now. Uh, you know, the scholars uh, change sometimes, but it's the same idea. So we have the DNA chain, which is the code of life. And the idea is that it's a, it's a rule-based system. So if we change uh, the code a little bit, we end up with uh, different living creatures. And then it's not done randomly. It's done in such a way that they are adapted to the environment where they live. So it's basically the idea that we want to bring into architecture. So find a set of rules that we can manipulate and play with to generate uh, housing solutions that are customized and adapted to the context, you know, the physical, in social context. So the idea is not new. I mean, this is a very old idea uh, in architecture. So if you look back into the history of architecture and, and see um, the treatises of architecture by Vitruvio, and, and you know, not just in the Western world, you can also find books like these in Asia, in Asia like for instance, in China, in India, and, and so on. So these are books that specify how buildings should be designed within a cultural, uh, certain cultural context 
and you can actually, you know, sometimes the books are written in such a way that's very straightforward to turn, uh, you know, the rules into a computer program that can be used to generate buildings with uh, the features that are encoded into the set of rules. So in this case, for instance, you see, you know, uh, a Roman theater being designed by a computer program that encoded the rules for designing theaters in Vitruvius uh, uh, classical uh, treatise. And here at the, at the, on the right hand side at the bottom, you see actually a physical model that was produced after the output of the computer program. So in basically in this slide, I'm trying to summarize the kind of approach that I'm advocating. So you have a rule-based design system that is able to generate customized designs. And then you have a digital fabrication system that will allow you to very quickly in an affordable way to materialize the housing uh, solution. So talking about the use of the different technology uh, that we do in the world studio. So this, this is what the diagram is trying to, uh, to show. So you have the building and we can construct different representations of the building. So you can have uh, you know, a, a physical model, you can have uh, you know, drawings, you can have a digital model, you can, you can have what we call you know, a computational model. So it's a rule-based model that captures how the design can be generated. And you also have what you call an analog model, uh, meaning um, you know, that you can find a way to describe the performance of uh, the building. So, you know, it might be a structural performance, it might be environmental performance and, and, and so on. So this is basically the technological framework. So you see you know, different uh, models that were generated after the World Studio in Rio. So we scanned a favela. So you basically what we did, we, we went from the, the, the buildings, from the construction into a digital model using 3D scanning. And then you use this digital model to actually produce the physical model that you see here. So uh, scanning and, and, and then fabrication. And then we use virtual reality you know, to give people the opportunity to visit the site in an immersive environment. As you know, favelas you know, are far away from the school where I teach. Uh, they are also not very safe places. So the idea is for the students to be able to go site visiting whenever they want it, we built the virtual reality um, model. And also at the same time, we extracted rules, the rule-based rules that described how the, the, the settlement grew incrementally over time. So this is the basic concept. So a design system that takes you know, information about the context, uh, you know, uh, about the site, about the people, and generates customized solutions. So if you look into a little bit more <clears throat> depth into the design system, you have a subsystem that uh, you know, reads the context and generates a design brief. And then you have a generative system that takes the design brief and according to an existing set of rules, generates different candidate solutions. Because you have different possible solutions, you need to find a way to rate and rank the solutions. And that's the, the, you know, the task of the evaluation system. And once you have that, you also need another system to find what's the solution that serves best the current context. So this is basically the idea about the uh, you know, design system. So what you see here is, is actually you know, uh, different examples. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, you know, you see an interface that was uh, designed by a visiting scholar at the SCDC, Christian Petsinski. So he basically he put the set of rules in a way that created a tangible interface that you can use to design your own house. So it's a rule-based set, at the, you know, under, under, underlying the system, but you actually play it in a very uh, friendly way, even by people who are not designers. So you can do this at the housing scale, but you can also do this at the urban scale. So you can basically uh, you know, uh, also devise a set of rules to generate different possibilities for the urban plan, which we can manipulate and use uh, to discuss the solution with the stakeholders, you know, the town hall, the promoters, the developers, you know, the people who are funding um, the, the development and so on in the future um, you know, inhabitants as well. So basically it's the same idea, a set of rules that you can play on different scales to generate solutions that are tailored to the specific um, uh, context. This is the work of one of my uh, former PhD students, Jose Beiron, which is also now teaches in, in Lisbon. So uh, the idea is that by following this approach, you can generate customized houses and very diverse uh, urban um, environments. 
So this is basically what we teach students to do uh, in the world studio. So what you see here is actually the output of the studio last uh, spring. So we were in Ahmedabad in India. So we did the informal settlements. We students studied the settlements, extracted the rules. You know, they went into the houses, talked to people, you know, got uh, various sorts of information about the different sites uh, that we visited. We met with the NGOs, with the representatives of the local town hall and so on. And, and at the end, they devised a set of rules that could uh, be used to generate different uh, solutions for the urban environment, but also different customized solutions and it's more or less what the animation is showing. And at the end, you can get a very diverse environment, which is very different from the traditional formal approach in which you repeat you know, a, a few uh, house types and where the environment becomes very, very repetitive. So uh, once you know how to generate different customized solutions, you need to find a way to materialize the solution. And this is actually the focus of my presentation today. You basically have two possibilities. Uh, in one way, it's you know the idea of uh, the kit of parts. You generate standard components and then you use uh, you know the systems to uh, assemble those components in different ways to generate different houses. Another possibility is actually to use uh, 3D printing, so digital fabrication to uh, you know use the 3D digital model of the house to control a fabrication system that is able to print. Uh, the house. And that's what we have been doing uh, more recently to find ways to make uh, this um, possible. So let's, uh, you know, uh, go a little bit deeper into this idea. If you look at uh, human bones, for instance, you see, uh, you know, that they, they are not homogeneous. They have different densities. They are denser uh, when they need to endure, uh, you know, bigger forces and they are lighter and less dense, you know, in the, in the parts that are less subjected to those, those forces. And this is basically the idea that we want to bring into our architecture as well. So we talked about housing and, uh, you know, at the scale of housing, then we talked about the large scale of urban planning. Now we are going down and talking about the same idea at the scale of the building component. For instance, if you have a wall, the loads are not uh, transmitted through the wall in the same way. There are parts of the, the wall that have in, to endure stronger forces. So the idea is that actually you design the material to, uh, to the performance, to maximize the performance of the building component. In this case, what we have is you know, a different porosity. So we use less material where we can, and we use more material when we need. So the idea is to make the construction lighter, you know, minimize the use of material resources, but also at the same time, increase the performance of the building from the energy viewpoint, for instance, because we can you know, use cork as a component in the, uh, in the concrete. And that's exactly what we see here. So it's uh, what you call functionally graded cork to concrete. It basically, you replace part of the sand aggregates by cork granules to increase uh, you know, the capability of the wall uh, you know, the thermal performance of the wall. So the idea is that on one side, you have an increased amount of cork to shield the construction uh, from, you know, the weather outside. And then you have a system that's actually able to do that. So if you see uh, very carefully in this video, uh, on one hand, you have, uh, you know, concrete with sand. On the other hand, we have concrete with cork. And by changing the relative speed of the two pumps, you can change the gradient uh, of the concrete. So increasing or decreasing the amount of cork uh, to maximize uh, the performance. So that's basically uh, the idea. Uh, I have a colleague here at Penn State. Uh, her name is Shadina Zarin, uh, and she has been working on the same idea, but transitioning from glass to concrete, you know, go progressively from uh, concrete to glass. Uh, those, this has many advantages, especially if you are designing for a harsh environment like Mars, because you don't have, uh, you know, there's no connection between the windows and the wall, and therefore you minimize the risk of leaks, which is a very important factor uh, on, a, you know, on, on a place like Mars, where the, the houses need to be pressurized because there is no atmosphere um, on Mars. So uh, this idea of printing in concrete is very complex. There's, you know, you see here on this slide, uh, you know, different variables that you need to learn, uh, you know, to understand and learn how they are related to each other to make 3D printing successful. 
uh, the environment has an impact. If it's rainy or you know, if there's humidity in the air, the material has a different behavior. In depending on uh, the season where the material of, uh, was made, it has a different behavior. For instance, materials that were made in winter would require less water when mixed, uh, you know, to make the concrete. Um, so you have uh, the temperature, humidity, and pressure as factors that influence how the material behaves. And they have the composition of the material, you know, the amount of binder, the type and the amount of aggregates, uh, you know, the, whether you have, you know, um, reinforcement, uh, fibers uh, or, you know, rebars and so on. So you have different material properties and, uh, and these material properties affect the extrudability of the material or, or the printability of the material. And then you have, uh, you know, variables connected to the printing system, like, you know, uh, the pump speed, the, how you um, relate water to the dry mix, you know, uh, which is also related to the feed rate of the dry mix in, in the, the feed rate, the flow rate of the water, the pumping speed, which is when you extract extruding the material, and then, you know, the speed of the robotic arm. So all these variables are related with each other and you need to find the right combination of variable, var variable values for the printing to be successful. And then you have to think about two-pass design, you know, and two-pass design is important because of how the material behaves, as we, I will explain uh, later. So uh, when the material is extruded, it starts setting and it takes some time. So depending the amount of time that it takes for the nozzle to come back to the same point, the material might have different behaviors. And this is enough to cause collapse if it's not enough time, if there's not enough time in between uh, different passes of the, uh, of the nozzle. And then you need to think about, you know, what's the building, what are appropriate building designs, you know, the shape of the building, so shapes that can be 3D printed, the size, which affects and is controlled by, um, you know, the reach of the robotic arm, for instance. So as you can see, there are many different variables related to each other, and what you need to do is to learn how they are related. So what we are trying is to model, create a mathematical model that relates all these variables so that you can control the process in a very rigorous uh, way. So this is exactly, you know, what this movie tries to show. Everything seems to be fine, but all of a sudden uh, it's going to collapse. And you now we need to understand why this cylinder collapsed. What were the factors that affect the, you know, uh, the collapse that caused the collapse? Is, was it the, the speed of robotic arm? Is it the composition of the material? Is it the design of the tool path? So we need to understand uh, that. So basically what we need to do, we need to work on different fronts. We need uh, to design the material. So there are different material, possible material compositions. Uh, and there are different types of concrete. For instance, it's Portland cement based concrete, but it's also geopolymer concrete, which actually has many benefits, you know, as a lower ecological footprint. Um, but in, a, in summary, um, we need to develop mixtures that are extrudable, that can be printed, and they have the properties, the structural uh, strength properties, then, uh, you know, the thermal conductance properties required to make houses that will work um, well. Then we also need to design the printing system, you know, um, the type of uh, our nozzle, the type of robotic arm or the type of mechanical system that's used, uh, you know, to deposit the material in space, the type of pump, you know, how the pump uh, it mixes the water with the dry mix, uh, you know, the robot to control the whole process and so on. So as you can see, the system can also have different configurations and what we need to do is to find the configuration that's more adequate to the current uh, situation. So we, these are different, uh, you know, uh, variations of the system that we have developed over time until we came to the, uh, you know, the configuration that we have today and we'll see later on. So we also need to study the material behavior, for instance, after being printed. So because uh, concrete takes time to set, um, it's going to start deforming under the weight of the subsequent layers. So you need to model that deformation. And the reason why you want to do that is because you want to end up with the shape that you designed. Okay, but for that to happen, sometimes you actually, when you design the tool path, you need to distort the shape so that the, when the material deforms, you get the right shape. So we are you know, doing studies 
to understand uh, how the material deformation occurs and try to capture that into mathematical model that we can use to inform uh, the design of the toolpath. And so this is basically, you know, a slide that tries to show what happens. So on the uh, on the left hand side, you see, you know, um, a cylinder that uh, we attempted to print without any kind of compensation in the toolpath design. And then, and then the subsequent cylinders were at different increasing rates of compensation. In, you know, the next one has a compensation for uh, layer height deformation, but not for layer width. Uh, and then in the last one, it's, it's fully compensated. So we actually were able to print the cylinder uh, that we wanted uh, because we compensated for the material deformation. Um, so this is some images of the work that we did for the NASA competition. Uh, I think then the competition was very well uh, designed. Uh, we had to, you know, go through different stages, which help us to develop the technology in a, in a very quickly. Uh, we had to print cylinders. We had to test the cylinders under compression because they needed to reach a minimum strength uh, to, you know, be usable for the design of houses. Same thing with beams. Uh, they also need to endure a certain level of flexural strength so that we could actually use the material that has the right or the minimum compressive and flexural strength. And the third stage was to design a dome, which you know works with both compressive and uh, you know and uh, tension uh, forces. Uh, so these are different stages of, of, of the competition. Then you have to make sure that you could seal uh, the building because on Mars, as I said, you know the uh, the uh, the conditions um, are very different from Earth. There is no atmosphere, or it's a one percent of the Earth atmosphere. It means, this means that the buildings need to be pressurized. We need to make sure that there were no leaks, that you could print completely sealed environment. You, you had to develop a system to place reinforcement, automatically place reinforcement in certain areas, not just fibers, but rebars. Then uh, you had to make sure that you know, the, the material could endure the freeze-saw cycle that happens on Mars, where the, you know, the, the, the changes in the difference in temperature from day and night and from the summer uh, to the winter or, or the equator or to the pole is very big. So it's in the order of uh, 150 uh, Celsius degrees. So you need to make sure that the material will be able to endure these changes in the environment. And then at the same time, you know, because construction is not just about houses, uh, but uh, I mean, the walls, the foundational walls and roof is also about the windows. So we have to develop a system to automatically place uh, window frames um, in, during the construction, during the printing, make sure that the robots did not collide with, with each other. So that's something we need to take in, in, into account in design of the building. So basically we were designing the, the process and the products, you know, the printing system and the, the, the shelter that we uh, wanted to build um, on Mars. As you can see it's gonna place uh, the window uh, at the right spot. Um, we also run different tests to understand the kind of shapes that could be 3D printed without formwork. And we have a good reason not to use formwork. Uh, in, the, in that case, it's on Mars, there, so there are no trees. You cannot make easily formwork. But also because formwork can account up to 40% uh, of the construction costs. So if we find, if we are able to develop a process yeah, where we can print houses without, uh, you know, uh, you know, the formwork, we can make the houses much cheaper. But to do that, we need to understand the kind of shapes that can be produced. So you see here, you know, we tried to uh, print um, shapes that were inclined, find what's the, what was the maximum angle that we could print uh, without the structure collapsing. So they could actually develop enclosing structures, uh, you know, and talking about the roof. And at the same time, we wanted to develop a process to make, uh, you know, the buildings, it's not enough for the building to work well. It needs to look well. It, it, it looks to be uh, statically pleasing. So we were also experimenting with different surfaces, textures, and so on to make the building more interesting. Uh, and that's all basically what you see. It's the work of one of the students in the uh, concrete printing class that we teach here at Penn State. Um, this is actually, you know, something that we printed uh, last week. Um, this is, you know, a section of a wall um, for um, a, sh a shelter. Um, 
and that's the work of one of the students team uh, in the in the course so as you can see you know everything seems to be going well the wall is inclined there are actually two wall panes that are connected to each other to make the structure stronger uh, and I think everything seems to be fine but then they made an error in the two pass design and you see that part of the structure will collapse at, at some point um, I think it's going to happen now yeah you see it, it collapsed at the end and there's a good reason it, you know they made an error in the two pass design so it went back immediately after it went uh, through a certain line and because the material underneath was not uh, hard enough it collapsed it caused you know that part of the structure to collapse as you can see we need to develop ways to design tool paths that you know lead to successful uh, at printings. Uh, this is you know other work of other students. Uh, you see uh, you know a dome structure, what was inspired in Persian domes. You know you permit the transition between you know a square shape of the room to the roof. So this uh, the idea is that you would build this on the top of the shape on the left hand side. So these are different experiments. Uh, that the students were making uh, in the class. And this is what we want to do at the end. We want to be able to produce houses uh, that are affordable and that can be built very quickly in different environments and using local materials. So we, we have, are experimenting with different mixes. Some are cement-based mixes. Others are actually uh, based on clay and lime and working to check the, you know, the extrudability uh, and the, the strengths of these various uh, mixtures. Because we are talking about moving from site to site, we also need to think about the logistics of the process. How can we transport the printing a system from place to place? So these are images of what we did at the NASA competition. So we had to very carefully design the transportation system to make sure that all the elements would fit in a truck or in, in this case, in several, in, in several trucks. So what you see, here on the uh, right hand side you see that they have a very large silo with all the materials required and they have a small silo so you need to find a way to transport the material from the big silo to the small silo and then from the small silo to the pump and then to the pump to the robot so that you could actually print and i think you know that's uh we're going to show here um let's just make sure Of course, there is a broken link. So let me just say here. Can you see the movie? Sorry? Yes. Yeah, okay, very good. Uh, so um, I could put the sound.
So continuing with the presentation. Sarah, how much time do I have left? You're really on time. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I think we, I can stop here and you know allow for room for discussion because I think it's enough to uh, you know spice up a little bit of the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I open up uh, the discussion for everyone. I don't know who wants to, let me, if someone online wants to pose a question or someone in the room, of course, wants to pose a question. You want, teacher? Okay. So you're in the room. Uh, let's see, okay, teacher Vermont. I'll take this one. Yeah, you can take it. It's often a bit back. But okay. be careful with the step. Yeah. Just okay. Okay. I'll I'll do okay. this. Okay. I'll do this. Um, I, I have a question for um, first speaker, and I guess it because um, if the conclusion of that presentation is that um, the architectures or the urban planners uh, recommend facial masks, it seems to say that the architects or urban planners um disqualify themselves as uh, being able to to contribute to this uh, to, to the battling of this um, pandemia i would say that that is too fast uh, so in europe the architects did a lot to improve the the health quality of uh, um, um, the population in the 19th century up to the 20th century um, so Actually, I, 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 yeah, I would not be happy with that answer. I would say, yes, please uh, continue your work. The architecture can do more. And so that, therefore, I would, would like to uh, move to Chef Eduard. What, what, what would your conclusion be for, let's say, the next Fatella you uh, may print um, or are built otherwise? How would you incorporate measures against uh, this virus or another virus? Or do you also see that you don't have any ability to do something there? That's my question. To both first. Okay, thank you. Okay, maybe Reiner, do you want to start? No, I'm not, I'm not saying architects can't contribute. It's just that uh, in the world of things, it seems like the most important right now is the individual responsibility. That uh, the architects, it, it, it takes longer, more planning, more money, uh, very valuable. But the individual responsibility is really probably paramount. And that really needs to be emphasized. And that's really what the message is. I mean, there, there, there's many things we can do but I, I think in long and short of it is that uh, we need to get people aware of these issues and to take it seriously. That's really what the bottom line is. I don't know if this answers your question well, but uh, that would be the, my result. <laughs> No, because I see it doesn't. <laughs> if I agree with your conclusion, you give away the problem to someone else. Um, say, say if you would, if I, always an, uh, an analogy is always uh, dangerous because when it comes to talk about the analogy, uh, if you say, well, um, there are too many accidents in a house, um, well, the architect responsible to have regulation to have your house more safe rather than to say well uh, people should not do that should not act unsafe uh, I agree people should not act unsafe but still I would like to know from you what you think the planning can do to uh, prevent in 10 years time let's say 10 years time to prevent um, infection by COVID so, so I agree with your conclusion, but I still want to know from you, <laughs> architects too. And, and may, maybe uh, Chassé can tell us. <laughs> well, let, let me just uh, respond in part. So the thing that we, uh, we've been looking at uh, in, the, in the various projects, 
we really have little control over what happens. And what we have to figure out is that what's the minimum that we, or the minimum becomes the maximum that we can do in order to encourage uh, better practices, uh, better, less accidents, as you put it. Uh, but what happens is the, 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 the thing that was interesting when uh, Jorge showed the, um, the project in Brazil, the mass housing project, it was in the upper right, all the houses look the same. Uh, what I've been seeing is that it's true at the beginning, they all look the same. Uh, after you go back there six months later, a year later, they all look different. And so this individual, you could say uncontrolled or individualism that you see, this customization, is something that is um, a process of the families. And that's very difficult to control. Uh, that's, it's, it's, it becomes an individual responsibility. And you take that farther, you say, okay, uh, they're going to do the, the buildings individually. They need to then be aware that in the environment, in the community, they have to, there are certain responsibilities that come with it. So um, what I've seen is that um, uh, there's really, uh, we can build a whole house and that's fine. But uh, in the reality of it is we can't afford to do that. And so we build something minimum and then we rely upon the individualism to do right, less accidents. And that's difficult to handle. Uh, that's a matter of, uh, you know, they have many training programs, they have manuals, they all don't work very well, but they, they do these things. They have uh, word of mouth neighbors, uh, which are much more effective. But uh, it, it comes down to the individual again. Uh, we can make the, the basis for it, uh, but we can't really determine what the outcome is. You know, it's going to be what the community dictates, if you like, the community reference of that. Um, so what, what people have been looking at, what we've been looking at, uh, what's the absolute minimum that you can do? We've been looking at specifically on the layout. Instead of a full layout and so on and so forth, we looked at what's the absolute minimum that we can do with the layout in order to maximize the potential to keep it safe, but also the potential to allow the involvement of people to do what they're going to do anyhow. With uh, We can't really control it. And so what can we do to control it? And that's really... I have no easy answers. It's uh, it's uh, contextual, mostly. Um, I will I'll, I'll send you some some uh, some of the things to lay out, which looks at the minimum uh, effect that you do in a plan, which then can offer the both the freedom to do it, but also the rigidity of a of the infrastructure of the functional aspects of it, if you like. I'll get this from Jorge. Okay, thank How's you, that? Leonard. Uh, do, 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 do you want to comment? E, yes, let me share a screen. Uh, so this is a work that I didn't talk about today, but that we are developing. So we are trying to find a relationship between urban configuration and patterns of COVID propagation using machine learning. So the idea is to understand how different urban configurations affect um, the propagation of diseases like COVID. And so they could actually generate recommendations for the design of cities in the future. Um, so this is on, on the other hand. So this is actually trying uh, to foresee and anticipate what might happen and, and thereby avoiding it. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. There's another sorry. question. Another question in the room. Uh, sorry, uh, I would uh, probably the comments that or the question that I will put is more to the professor and, and then to you. That you rock, uh, professor. You point very well to the density and the compactness on the Middle East and also in the some of the informal settlements. And at the same time, you put 
some questions on the what people react on the pandemic in the COVID-19. So I would like to know uh, in housing, because in the informal settlements, usually in planning, we are very, very, at least in Middle East, because I'm from that part, uh, we are the, what the, the context of the Middle East and the context of that, uh, that planning is completely different with what we have in West. So the context of the pandemic in there and what we are going to suggest as a rules, sometimes is going to be changed. I had a small picture, unfortunately I cannot share in here. It was in a school in uh, Tehran, one of the private schools for the children that they are in the same school, they put some clusters in the class. So each uh, student sit in his, let's say, uh, in his house, inside the class. So you, when the teacher speaks, nobody use the masks because everybody is under the cover of the small shelter, but, and everybody see the teacher. So we have something like cluster in cluster. Can we do something? Do you think uh, um, looking to the housing or looking to the spaces, I'm not just looking to the housing, I'm looking to the whole area as a public spaces and other spaces in the city. Do you think, can we uh, think about clusters, something like clusters or cells inside another cell in the component of the city as a, as a context? And the same for you in the design, because uh, at least the method that you use for the, I think it was the project for Mars, mm -hmm. if I understand well, uh, the point that you put over there are so small clusters, but they totally, they make it uh, the, as a whole. So do you think we can have the same architectural patterns in the cities in the future? Probably in the, in the theory we can, but in the uh, formal world and in the real world, can we have the same thing or not? Probably it's, uh, first, the uh, previous question as a, <laughs> a architectural, detail, a architectural discussion or architectural rule, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Let me just, just say a comment on that. Uh, it's interesting seeing if you have small groups. Um, I, I spoke to these uh, teachers and they, uh, they're putting students in smaller groups. And the idea is to, is to limit the amount of infection. Like we will put it in groups of four and these four may get sick, but not the other ones. And so the question becomes, how many people are you willing to risk at a time in a cluster? Uh, you can make individual shelters. And so that means uh, one person is valuable, uh, very, very uh, space intensive, very costly. Or you can say, let's do it by class by class. And that's 20 people at a time are at risk. Or if you take a neighborhood of a city, you can you could uh, easily make neighborhoods. Um, how many people is acceptable as a, a risk factor that can get sick, and then you can move on to another group? It's, it's a different kind of a question. It's 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 a difficult. Um, the, 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 but it, it struck me as be very interesting in a school that I was talking to. They deliberately said. Okay, we're going to group them into, they use five people, I think. So if these five get sick, they don't get the other people sick. So we will sequester people in groups of five. Okay, well, why not six? Why not seven? Why not three? And it, it's an interesting kind of a debate. It, it, uh, that's a difficult one to answer. Uh, you could say that how many people does it take uh, to learn from each other? Uh, three? To make it useful? Don't know. An interesting theory. Jose, would you like to comment on? Yeah, maybe I, I can say a few words. Um, I mean, this is a very unprecedented situation. So it's unique 
Uh, and obviously, when we design an environment, we cannot design an environment just from one viewpoint. We need to take into consideration many different viewpoints. Despite um, that fact, I think it's possible to design cities in a way that we minimize uh, you know, the propagation rates of diseases like COVID. And that's exactly what we're trying to do to understand uh, you know, um, how the configuration has that kind of impact. But obviously, you know, so there are two ways. One is the spatial configuration of the city. The other one is how people behave in that spatial configuration. Obviously, spatial configuration might promote certain kinds of behavior more than others, and therefore also uh, affects, you know, uh, the interaction uh, with people. For instance, in, in LA, so there, you know, in comparing LA and New York in the US, that those are those two big cities, you know, a very large population, but with totally different propagation rates. Um, and it has to do with the fact that, of things like walkability. You know, if, if the city is more walkable, which is something that up to now everybody wanted, right? Everybody wanted, you know, people uh, to avoid using the car and make, you know, a, a, less, uh, a less environmental impact. But the fact is when, you know, when the city is more walkable, you know, the uh, likelihood of contracting a disease like COVID increases. Um, so um, I don't know, I have to, to wait until the end of the, of the study to get a more a specific response to that question. Okay, Zivid, you wanted to ask yeah. something? My question is to Professor Reinhardt. Uh, my question is to Professor Reinhardt. I will maybe have one for you. But also, but first for Professor Reiner. Um, regarding what you presented, and I work in urban planning, my question to you is if you think that it's kind of uh, in the, something is in the, um, uh, something that, we, how, how can I say this? It, it, um, it, it's a statement from Abdul Malik Simon, that he, he talks about people's infrastructure and um, he attached this idea of people as uh, infrastructure to informal context the, uh, as the one that you were presenting. So, um, do you think this is right now that the, the, the consequence of the, this three C's strategy that you uh, talk about in your presentation is letting us to um, um, this only idea of people as infrastructure. I mean, is, is, is this a time where people will have to find their new own ways to suppress this moment, as uh, Jose was uh, talking about right now, about this uh, very singular moment that we are um, facing, and in a way that we don't have quite clear answers to, to how, how to manage this, this, this time that we are living, this, this, this situation. So uh, if, if this is so, uh, and I, I can now go back to your question, what is the role of uh, perhaps not the architects, just architects, but architects, urban planners, uh, those who structure life in common? Um, because this idea of, of, of uh, Abdul Malik Simon uh, about people as infrastructure is related to uh, a, a place to, to a space that is th where there's no structure. So people assume they have to be, to have, to, they, they have to get this role as infrastructure. So uh, are we going to that way, uh, to that place also uh, in, in a more general term, not, not only regarding the context of informality, is this what you think we might be facing in the future? Well, um, just a quick response in part to that. The, we were looking at uh, different uh, layouts more or less on a neighborhood scale. And uh, we were looking at different alternatives. On one, do you have a complete neighborhood? Uh, lots are designed, uh, the streets are designed, uh, infrastructure is designed, it's complete, it's a complete standard development. 
And then what you can do, you can start taking things away and seeing, okay, what's left and how can you make it work? Um, it, it seems like at the end of it is that uh, you, you have to do the main guiding structures and then it depends in part on the, on the cultural aspects. To what degree can you utilize the culture, the, the, the social community to do things? Uh, you could have a, for example, um, <laughs> not a good example. Um, you, you know, the, the community agrees you don't rob people. We all agree to that, it's a, it's a social thing. In some cases, uh, you might say, well, in our community, we have gangs and this is not so, it's a different game. So I, I think the, the, the community, the culture, the social uh, sense of community is an important factor when you design these things. There's no easy answer. You obviously have to, um, you have to have some sort of a, a framework. Uh, you can think about which framework is useful. Uh, you've seen the one where the article about uh, dirt road grids, where I think Shlomo Angel comes up and says, okay, uh, what we need to do is to um, make easements, uh, 400 by 400 meter easements uh, square, you know, spacing 400 by 400. And this will then guide the development of cities. And then a various protocol for development that occurs inside that. And then there's different options depending on the capacity of the government, on the uh, control of the, of the communities and so on and so forth. I mean, there's different ways that you can design it. In the, in the case of the virus, it becomes more interesting because then you have uh, the risk factor how many people are you willing to put on the risk? A whole neighborhood at a time? And then control what happens in that neighborhood? You know, what they do, in, in effect what they do now, for example, in the schools, to go into, say, the schools where I work, uh, to get in there, you have to be tested or you can't get in. Uh, who, uh, what's to prevent that from being done on a neighborhood or a smaller scale? It's very expensive. It's a very, they need all sorts of other things. It's possible though. So uh, there's, there's different ways that one can think about it. The, what, I, what seems to be, everybody's hoping that there's going to be a miracle and the vaccine will end this all and we don't have to worry about it. The detractors say that's not true. There will always be another epidemic. And we need to think about this more seriously. The problem is to what degree do we change cities to reflect that, to think about the risk in the future? It's an interesting question, a very difficult one. The, um, the uh, what would you say, the motivations between different actors is to use everything to the extreme, which uh, is obviously detrimental in the long run, particularly for the virus, current virus, high density, exploiting every little space you have, smaller spaces. That's not a good world for the virus. So it's a worthwhile study. It's a worthwhile exploring. It, it, it's good that more people think about it and see how to, how to handle it. But it seems like something will have to give. Hmm? Okay. Question no. for yes, Lizzie. Josette, just a small provocation for you. Why to customize a context that is already customized? And I'm talking about the favelas in Rio and um, the the Canisos in Maputo, um, the, um, the formalities is, is self-customized. What do you bring your customization to um, uh, those kind of informal contexts? And this is something that I related to the previous question about infrastructure. One of the most uh, urgent problems in this kind of informal context is infrastructure and uh, not customization. So 
um, I know um, um, the, the process that you developed regarding customization, and uh, I would like you to um, develop a little bit more the process regarding the infrastructure that you, you didn't mention it on your presentation. I think that would be interesting to, to, to go a little bit more on that issue. So, um, <clears throat> so there are two things. One is what we have now, these informal settlements. The other thing is, is that uh, what we would like to have. So we don't want the informal settlements as we have them today. We want them to be better. And I see two possible pathways. One way is to assist people and help them generate an environment that it does not have the flaws that we find today. And I'm talking about you know, structure or you know, the location in places that might be dangerous and so on. The other one is actually to hack that process and develop a new approach to urban design that's informed by what we have learned uh, uh, from the study of these settlements. I have been focused more on the second one, but I find the first one um, you know, also uh, interesting. And in, in, in from the ethical viewpoint, I think you know, it actually has some advantages. So uh, a short answer to your question. Um, we, the, yes, they are customized, but we want to design environments that are equally customized, but do not have the flaws that inform, informal, informal settlements have today, like the lack of, uh, of public spaces, the lack of infrastructure, you know, uh, um, the lack of structural stability in some cases, um, and so on. So it's basically trying to develop a new approach uh, to urban design um, that's, you know, that learns um, from them. Is can, I, can I also pose a question? Reiner, do you want to say something? No, it's an interesting point about the open spaces in the informal sector. We were looking at uh, the fringe settlements uh, around Cairo, and uh, you see these massive amount of housing. They, uh, the people invest, uh, build all houses, take up all the open spaces. And the question was, how can we get them to incorporate uh, to keep an, a certain area open for parks. In Egypt, I guess in all the Arabic countries, uh, open areas, parks, uh, family gatherings become a, a very important social element. And we were trying to grapple with it. And it's, uh, uh, we were thinking of different ways. We didn't come to a solution yet. We're still working on that. You know, do, does a city come in and say, look, buy this thing, this piece of land at a certain spacing? and hold it, um, you know, becomes a, a land release policy that you have to work on. Uh, do you give an incentive to the person selling it? In Egypt's case, uh, to the, the farmer, the fellain? Uh, do you say, look, uh, uh, you can develop this if you like illegally, but you have to leave this piece of land open. There's different mechanisms that one can play with. One has to see which one is the most effective. The, the, on the converse, there's so, so much pressure on developing land that it becomes much more difficult. But the fact is we're trying to somehow make sure that this open space gets saved. And that's, that's tricky. You know, if you go to any favela, they get filled up very quickly. Uh, you, you see studies where they, uh, this is it's, it's work by NGOs where they work together with communities and they it's a very labor intensive and they get the community to understand and to accept and to participate in working on open spaces, uh, cleaning up, uh, building playgrounds and so on and so forth and puts a value on it. It's possible to do that, but on a large scale, it's much more difficult. You can see you, there's cases, examples around the world, but they're not, it's not widespread. So it's, it's a, a problem that we're, <laughs> that we're stuck with or that we have to deal with, have to figure it out. Okay, thank you. I would also like to, to pose a question. So I, I like very much the sequence of these two presentations. And I have to confess that when Zedward came in, and the title was From Earth to Mars and Back. 
I have the, the idea that that was the solution. So we now go all to Mars. Maybe over there, there's the, the contagious is different. And then after some time, we can come back. But well, it's, it's not absolutely that the, the solution. Um, but I, I was also thinking of, of everything that you were saying and also everything that is now on the news and what architects are reasoning and also related to the, to the, to the topic of this conference and uh, the formal methods and these uh, generative design systems and, and all the constraints that we use in, in, uh, in design and that have been discussed here. So energy, function, durability, etc. And now we have a different constraint. So also earthquakes, tsunami, all the, all the issues that we have been addressing as catastrophes and we have already uh, solutions, but also the ventilation, the direct lightning, all of them which are still compromised in slums, for instance. So now we have a different, uh, different issue. So how can we, um, I don't know if this is too much, but make a generative design or a customized design for contagious. Uh, and also because, and when I say customized, is because um, there are different households also. What is the solution for a household of one? Are we, by creating distance in architecture, augmenting the rate of suicide? Um, what is, yeah, it's very different to have a person living alone and having to face this reality and having a family of five uh, into this reality. So, Rosette Bart, you there are very used to all this generative design and this customization. Can you imagine some, some variables that should be taken in place uh, to take care of this very complex and uh, with different uh, spheres um, problem? That's exactly what we are trying to achieve with that project on finding a relationship between urban configuration uh, and COVID propagation patterns um, so that you can take them into account in the design of new environments or, or the redesign and reintervention re in the existing environment. That's exactly what we are trying to do. It's not clear, obviously, you know, if we decrease density, uh, you know, the propagation rates will uh, lower. But as I said, you know, we have to design a city from multiple viewpoints. Uh, so we cannot, you know, just take into consideration COVID patterns. Uh, and who knows when the next uh, pandemic will come by again? Well, we have not got rid of this one yet, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a difficult question. Right. Does anyone online wants to pose a question before also Franklin wants to pose a question, but you do want? Okay. Yeah. May I? Yes, of course. Sure. I think my question mostly is to Jose here. Um, I really like the presentation and uh, I think most of it is out of my league, but I was just curious when you talk about mostly social housing or strategies for housing, whether it be favelas and personally from India, not from Ahmedabad, but not too far. Um, I was curious in a, in a general sense within this community that engages in this research, uh, is there ever a question of uh, making a real distinction between demolition and uh, tabula rasa versus working with what's already there. So in your presentation, you often said, there's a lot that the favelas already have uh, in terms of qualities, formal qualities is what I would call them. And then there's obviously a lot of infrastructural or so-and-so problems that need to be solved while keeping those qualities. How do, how do you uh, conduct this discourse basically? What's, what's really, important when you discuss uh, these matters amongst yourselves, maybe? I'm just curious. So um, we usually, we have a three year cycle in the studio. Mm -hmm. So you go to a location and we stay uh, there for three years. In the first year, you know, the goal of the studio is to upgrade the existing favela. So there's no, um, you know, Tablo Raza. So what we try to do is to be strategic, you know, do uh, what can be called, you know, a, a compuncture interventions to improve mm -hmm. the quality. The second year we expand the existing settlement if there is, you know, still space uh, for it to be expanded. 
And the third one, we go to a, a different place uh, in the same area and build a new development from scratch. So yes, I, okay. I, mean, I, I, I don't think we need to do tabula rasa. I think, you know, and they actually, Ahmedabad is very interesting. That's the reason why we chose to go there because it has a very interesting program in place to, you know, recover some of these settlements, to rehabilitate some of these settlements, which we visited. And they did a wonderful job and the people are, are very happy. So they basically introduce infrastructure, improve the quality, help people to improve the quality of their houses. And, you know, we were there and it's, it's pleasant. You know, I think, you know, they have, you know, a very interesting standards of living. Sure. And one quick uh, added question. Do you have a, a set of references that you go to always for irrespective of socioeconomic? Would you say pick up a quality or a specific factor from, let's say, the urban typologies in Hong Kong to apply to Ahmedabad or, or a favela? So, or do yeah. you... So, so I think, you know, there, there are some practic practical, very practical issues. So we went to Rio because I had contacts there. I knew the place. I had been there. I found uh, very interesting uh, the topography. Um, so that was some intellectual, you know, um, curiosity behind, uh, behind the selection of Rio. In India, we went because they were radically different from the ones in Rio. So in Rio, it's very steep. In Ahmedabad, it's very flat. Uh, and also because we had contacts there, uh, you know, and as you know, it's very important to have a local contacts to, you know, uh, be able to access, uh, you know, the community, talk to the people. Um, yeah, so we are considering going to Africa after, uh, in the next cycle. Let's see what happens. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Franklin, do you want, we are really out of time already, so very short question, okay. Okay, first I would like to salute Professor Gregor once again and thank you for your persistent uh, support of our, uh, of our uh, symposium for the last uh, nine years, I think. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the question I would like to put to you because it's the same question is about the architecture. Uh, addresses uh, so a very big social problem. Alt, my a, a very big social problem. Uh, as uh, for me, they also uh, in the city and the uh, well, uh, well, when we go to Mars, we have a very precise uh, uh, optimization criteria that we can fulfill with uh, technical solutions. When we deal with the dwell in your city, when the problems for humankind, uh, I think uh, we have uh, to deal with, we and I call with the professionals, uh, the scientists, the technicians that we, that we have. Well, technical solutions are, must be aware of the social, political, cultural, economical and so on, uh, situations and positions. And I think the, the technical is not, uh, is not uh, enough. And the, even uh, we technic, technic, technicians, professionals don't agree with uh, each other. Uh, you know, for example, I don't agree at all with uh, the refer refurbishment of uh, favelas and, uh, and so on. I, I'm still, uh, uh, Fond of the uh, Chateau of Atenas uh, and the modernism. And I think, the, for example, Lord Vienna and other uh, well known uh, intuition practitioners also are, are uh, trying to solve a problem that we think, I think it's, it's not possible. Dwelling is not possible to. To, uh, Can you go to the question? Because we are out of time. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, but it's not uh, ideological positions. I want to 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 question. It's haven't we to to take care to be aware of those very large uh, situations? I mean, to when uh, regarding uh, COVID, we have. 
very little amount of data for the moment, as Professor Gata has uh, explained. But uh, we have, for example, two countries with uh, almost uh, one third of the population, China and India, with, uh, you know, they have uh, not the, the change the cities they have, but they have complete COVID outbreak situations. Uh, and I would say China has uh, much more informal development in the, in the area and uh, also more compact. And even Hong Kong uh, is one of the most uh, dense population uh, in the world. And uh, this is not because of the, the cities as they are. Perhaps they uh, used masks for several years before the outbreak. I don't know, but uh, don't you think that uh, we have to, to deal with uh, that a broader amount of, of uh, situations uh, and considerations we have to, to deal with, economic, social, political, cultural, I don't know anything. <laughs> and the technical is not, uh, is not enough. It was not a question. Yeah, I'm trying to find out what the question was, but I think it was more a comment than a yeah. question. Um, I, mean, I, I agree. I mean, um, the problem is not just technical, uh, but obviously it also depends on how you define uh, technical. Um, for instance, in, in Rio, we use the VR system to enable uh, site visits, right? And then we found out through the study that we made after um, the, that environment, you know, trying to track the usefulness and the suitability of a, a VR environment to support uh, site visits. We found out that when we visit the sites, we engage all of our senses, not just vision and audition. We, you know, use smell, use the taste I remember still. so we had, at some point we had lunch at the favela you know they have a small family restaurant there and we ate there and students said this was so important for us to understand the place um, you know and it's difficult to convey the things through a VR system so I completely agree it's not just a technical problem it's a human problem and in the, I think you need to build empathy with the people. And that's something that it was useful. I remember students saying, you know, we came here and we realized these people are absolutely normal. They have the same expectations in life that we do. And that's at the end of the day, that's what it counts. That's the most important and to be able to raise that kind of empathy so that you can design for, for the people. So in short, yes, it's not just a technical problem. Okay. so. Thank you a lot. I, I would I would love to put, to continue the discussion, but we are out of time already, and then we need to relax a little bit for the next panel. So I would like very much to thank you, Reinhard Gother and Josette Bart, for being present in this symposium. You created a very wonderful discussion among everyone. Uh, so thank you again, and we hope that we you can come to Lisbon in a, in the next opportunity so that we can discuss. Uh, in a different way and also show Reiner the, the city because we, we now know that he doesn't know Lisbon. So, oh, 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 okay, Porto, yeah, we, we, have, a, we have here a, a regional battle. I, th I think you should start by Lisbon, but that's okay. Okay, so thank you very much and all, all of you also that were present and make questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay, so oh, uh, we will be back at six, okay, in, in a quarter of an hour, okay? So it's a short coffee break at this okay. moment. Sir, thank you very much for the invitation. I wish the best for the remainder of the symposium. And Reiner, it was very good to see you again, even though it's uh, through a window, but it's better <laughs> than nothing, I assume. Okay, no, thank you for inviting me. It's a uh, it uh, starts an opportunity to meet more often now. Now I have an excuse. Exactly. <laughs> we live the old times. No, no I, I think it's very interesting to get uh, different ideas and different perspectives. You know, we're sitting here so, so isolated. And uh, I hope that we can reciprocate and you come to Boston sometime. 
uh, and not I come to Lisbon, but you come to Boston, and we can, I can show you the, the <laughs> if we can get in, uh, I will show you the city. So, good. Thank you very much again, everyone. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs> we, are not, we are not going to switch this off, but I'm going to go away. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>